Hi friends and welcome back to Book Club with Ms. Dub. I'm Ms. Dub and today we are going to be reading chapter 11 in Prince Caspian by C.S. Lewis. If you have the text, I invite you to read along with me and if you don't, that's totally fine. Just listen in and let your imagination enjoy the story as I read. Let's go ahead and get started on chapter 11. Chapter 11, The Lion Roars. When the whole party was finally awake, Lucy had to tell her story for the fourth time. The blank silence which followed it was as discouraging as anything could be. I can't see anything, said Peter, after he had stared his eyes sore. Can you, Susan? No, of course I can't, snapped Susan, because there isn't anything to see. She's been dreaming. Do lie down and go to sleep, Lucy. And I do hope, said Lucy in a tremulous voice, that you will all come with me because, because I'll have to go with him whether anyone else does or not. Don't talk nonsense, Lucy, said Susan. Of course you can't go off on your own. Don't let her, Peter. She's being downright naughty. I'll go with her if she must go, said Edmund. She's been right before. I know she was, said Peter, and she may have been right this morning. We certainly had no luck going down the gorge. Still, at this hour of the night, and why should Aslan be invisible to us? He never used to be. It's not like him. What did the DLF say? Oh, I say nothing at all, answered the dwarf. It's, if you all go, of course I'll go with you. And if your party splits up, I'll go with the High King. That's my duty to him and King Caspian. But if you ask my private opinion, I'm a plain dwarf who doesn't think there's much chance of finding a road by night where you couldn't find one by day. And I have no use for magic lions, <clears throat> which are talking lions and don't talk, and friendly lions, though they don't do us any good, and whopping big lions, though nobody can see them. It's all bilge and beanstalks as far as I can see. He's beating his paw on the ground for us to hurry, said Lucy. We must go now, at least I must. You've no right to try to force the rest of us like that. It's four to one and you're the youngest, said Susan. Oh, come on, growled Edmund. We've got to go. There'll, no, there'll be no peace till we do. He fully intended to back Lucy up, but he was annoyed at losing his night's sleep and was making up for it by doing everything as sulkily as possible. On the march then, said Peter, wearily fitting his arm into his shield strap and putting his helmet on. At some other time, he would have said something nice to Lucy, who was his favorite sister. And he knew that whatever had happened, it was not her fault. <clears throat> but he couldn't help being a little annoyed with her all the same. Susan was the worst. Supposing I started behaving like Lucy, she said, I might threaten to stay here whether the rest of you went on or not. I jolly well think I shall obey the high king your majesty said trumpkin and let's be off if i'm not to be allowed to sleep i'd as soon march as stand here talking and so at last they got on the move lucy went first biting her lip and trying not to say all the things she thought of saying to susan but she forgot them when she fixed her eyes on aslan he turned and walked at a slow pace about 30 yards ahead of them the others had only Lucy's directions to guide them, for Aslan was not only invisible to them, but silent as well. His big cat-like paws made no noise on the grass. He led them to the right of the dancing trees. Whether they were still dancing, nobody knew, for Lucy had her eyes on the lion and the rest had their eyes on Lucy, and nearer the edge of the gourd. Cobbles and kettle drums, thought Trumpkin. I hope this madness isn't going to end in a moonlight climb and broken necks. For a long way, Aslan went along the top of the precipices. Then they came to a place where some little trees grew right on the edge. He turned and disappeared among them. Lucy held her breath for it looked as if he had plunged over the cliff, but she was too busy keeping him in sight to stop and think about this. She quickened her pace and was soon among the trees herself. Looking down, she could see a steep and narrow path going slantwise down into the gorge between the rocks and Aslan descending it. He turned and looked at her with his happy eyes. Lucy clapped her hands and began to scramble down after him. From behind her, she heard the voices of the others shouting, Hi, Lucy, look out for goodness sake. You're right on the edge of the gorge. Come back. 
And then a moment later, Edmund's voice saying, no, she's right, there's a way down. Halfway down the path, Edmund caught up with her. Look, he said in great excitement, look, what's that shadow crawling down in front of us? It's his shadow, said Lucy. I do believe you're right, Lou, said Edmund. I can't think how I didn't see it before, but where is he? Well, I almost thought I did, Okay. With his shadow, of course. Can't you see him? Well, I almost thought I did for a moment. It's such a rum light. Get on, King Edmund, get on, came Trumpkin's voice from behind and above. And then farther behind and still nearly at the top, Peter's voice saying, oh, buck up, Susan. Give me your hand. Why, a baby could get down here. And do stop grousing. In a few minutes, they were at the bottom and the roaring of water filled their ears. Treading delicately like a cat, Aslan stepped from stone to stone across the stream. In the middle, he stopped, bent down to drink, and as he raised his shaggy head, dripping from the water, he turned to face them again. This time, Edmund saw him. Oh, Aslan, he cried, darting forward. But the lion whisked round and began padding up the slope on the far side of the rush. Peter! Peter, cried Edmund, do you see? I saw something, said Peter, but it's so tricky in the moonlight. On we go though, and three cheers for Lucy. I don't feel half so tired now either. Aslan, without hesitation, led them to their left, farther up the gorge. The whole journey was odd and dreamlike. The roaring stream, the wet gray grass, the glimmering cliffs which they were approaching, and always the glorious, silently pacing beast ahead. Everyone except Susan and the dwarf could see him now. Presently, they came to another steep path up the, up the face of the farther precipices. These were far higher than the ones they had just ascended, and the journey up them was a long and tedious zigzag. Fortunately, the moon shone right above the gorge so that neither side was in shadow. Lucy was nearly blown when the tail and hind legs of Aslan disappeared over the top, but with one last effort, she scrambled after him and came out rather shaky-legged and breathless. On the hill, they had been trying to reach ever since they left Glasswater. The long, gentle slope, heather and grass, and a few very big rocks that shone white in the moonlight stretched up to where it vanished in a glimmer of trees about half a mile away. She knew it. It was the hill of the stone table. With a jingling of mail, the others climbed up behind her. Aslan glided on before them, and they walked after him. Lucy, said Susan in a very small voice. Yes, said Lucy. I see him now. I'm sorry. That's all right. But I've been far worse than you know. I really believed it was him. He, I mean, yesterday. When he warned us not to go down to the fir wood, and I re really believed it was him tonight when you woke us up. I mean, deep down inside. Or I could have if I'd let myself. But I just wanted to get out of the woods and, oh, I don't know. And what am I ever to say to him? Perhaps he won't need to say much, suggested Lucy. Soon they reached the trees and through them, the children could see the great mound, Aslan's Howe, which had been raised over the table since their days. Our side don't keep very good watch, muttered Trumpkin. We ought to have been challenged before now. Hush, said the other four, for now Aslan had stopped and turned and stood facing them, looking so majestic that they felt as glad as anyone who can, as anyone can who feels afraid, and as afraid as anyone can who feels glad. The boys strode forward. Lucy made way for them. Susan and the dwarf shrank back. Oh, Aslan, said King Peter, dropping on one knee and raising the lion's heavy paw to his face. I'm so glad and I'm so sorry. I've been leading them wrong ever since we started and especially yesterday morning. My dear son, said Aslan. Then he turned and welcomed Edmund. Well done, were his words. Then after an awful pause, the deep voice said, Susan? Susan made no answer, but the others thought she was crying. You have listened to fears, child, said Aslan. Come, let me breathe on you. Forget them. Are you brave again? A little, said Su a little, Aslan, said Susan. 
And now, said Aslan in a much louder voice with just a hint of roar in it, while his tail lashed his flanks. And now, where is this little dwarf, this famous swordsman and archer who doesn't believe in lions? Come here, son of earth, come here. And the last word was no longer the hint of a roar, but almost the real thing. Wraths and wreckage, grasped, gasped Trumpkin in the ghost of a voice. The children, who knew Aslan well enough to see that he liked the dwarf very much, were not disturbed, but it was quite another thing for Trumpkin, who had never seen a lion before, let alone this lion. He did the only sensible thing he could have done. That is, instead of bolting, he tottered toward Aslan. Aslan pounced. Have you ever seen a very young kitten being carried in the mother cat's mouth? It was like that. The dwarf hunched up in a little miserable ball, miserable ball hung from Aslan's mouth. <laughs> the lion gave him one shake and all his armor rattled like a tinker's path. And then, hey presto, the dwarf flew up in the air. He was as safe as if he had been in bed, though he did not feel so. As he came down, the huge velvety paws caught him as gently as a mother's arms and set him right way up too, on the ground. Son of earth, shall we be friends? asked Aslan. Yeah, yeah, yes, panted the dwarf, for it had not yet got its breath back. Now, said Aslan, the moon is setting. Look behind you. There is the dawn beginning. We have no time to lose. You three sons of Adam and son of earth, hasten into the mound and deal with what you will find there. The dwarf was still speechless and neither of the boys dared to ask if Aslan would follow them. All three drew their swords and saluted, then turned and jingled away into the dusk. Lucy noticed that there was no sign of weariness in their faces. Both the High King and King Edmund looked more like men than boys. The girls watched them out of sight, standing close beside Aslan. The light was changing. Low down in the east, Erevir, the morning star of Narnia, gleamed like a little moon. Aslan, who seemed larger than before, lifted his head, shook his mane, and roared. The sound, deep and throbbing at first, like an organ beginning on a low note, rose and became louder, and then far louder again, till the earth and air were shaking with it. It rose up from that hill and floated across all Narnia. Down in Miraz's camp, men woke, stared palely in one another's faces, and grasped their weapons. Down below that, in the great river, now at its coldest hour, the heads and shoulders of the nymphs and the great weedy bearded head of the river god rose from the water. Beyond it, in every field and wood, the alert ears of rabbits rose from their holes. The sleepy heads of birds came out from under wings. Owls hooted, vixens barked, hedgehogs grunted, the trees stirred. In towns and villages, mothers pressed babies close to their breasts, staring with wild eyes. Dogs whimpered and men leapt up, groping for lights. Far away on the northern frontier, the mountain giants peered from the dark gateways of their castles. What Lucy and Susan saw was a dark something coming to them from almost every direction across the hills. It looked at first like a black mist creeping on the ground, then like the stormy waves of a black sea rising higher and higher as it came on, and then at last like what it was, woods on the move. All the trees of the world appeared to be rushing toward Aslan, but as they drew nearer, they looked less like trees, and when the whole crowd bowing and curtsying and waving thin long arms to Aslan were all around Lucy, she saw that it was a crowd of human shapes. Pale birch girls were tossing their heads. Willow women pushed back their hair from their brooding faces to gaze on Aslan. The queenly beeches stood still and adored him. Shaggy oak men, lean and melancholy elms, shock-headed hollies, dark themselves, but their wives all bright with berries. 
and gay Rowans all bowed and rose again, shouting Aslan, Aslan in their various husky or creaking or wave-like voices. The crowd and the dance round as the crowd and the dance round Aslan, for it had become a dance once more, grew so thick and rapid that Lucy was confused. She never saw where where certain other people came from who were soon capering about among the trees. One was a youth dressed only in a fawn skin with vine leaves wreathed in his curly hair. His face would have been almost too pretty for a boy's if it had not looked so extremely wild. You felt, as Edmund said when he saw him a few days later, there's a chap who might do anything, absolutely anything. He seemed to have been, he seemed to have a great many names, Bromios, Basareus, and the Ram were three of them. There were a lot of girls with him, as wild as he. There was even, unexpectedly, someone on a donkey, and everybody was laughing, and everybody was shouting, Eon, Eon, e oi, oi, oi. It's, is it a romp, Aslan? cried the youth, and apparently it was, but nearly everyone seemed to have a different idea as to what they were playing. It may have been Tig, but Lucy never discovered who was it. It was rather like blind man's bluff, only everyone behaved as if they were blindfolded. It was not unlike Hunt the Slipper, but the slipper was never found. What made it more complicated was that the man on the donkey, who was an old and enormously fat, began calling out at once, refreshments, time for refreshments, and falling off his donkey and being bundled onto it again by the others while the donkey was under the impression that the whole thing was a circus and tried to give a display of walking on his hind legs. And all the time, there were more and more vine leaves everywhere. And soon, not only leaves, but vines, they were climbing up everything. They were running up the legs of the tree people and circling around their necks. Lucy put up her hands to push back her hair and found she was pushing back vine branches. The donkey was a mass of them. His tail was completely entangled and something dark was nodding between his ears. Lucy looked again and saw it was a bunch of grapes. After that, it was mostly grapes, overhead and underfoot and all around. Refreshments, refreshments, roared the old man. Everyone began eating, and whatever hot houses your people may have, you have never tasted such good grapes. Really good grapes, firm and tight on the outside, but bursting into cool sweetness when you put them into your mouth, were one of the things the girls had never had quite enough of before. Here, there were more than anyone could possibly want, and no table manners at all. One saw sticky and stained fingers everywhere, and though mouths were full, the laughter never ceased, nor the yodeling cries of eon, eon, e oi, 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 till all of a sudden, everyone felt at the same moment that the game, whatever it was, and the feast ought to be over, and everyone flopped down breathless on the ground and turned their faces to Aslan to hear what he would say next. At that moment, the sun was just rising and Lucy remembered something and whispered to Susan, I say, Sue, I know who they are. Who? The boy with the wild face is Bacchus and the old one on the donkey is Silenus. Don't you remember Mr. Tumnus telling us about them long ago? Yes, of course, but I say, Lou, what? I wouldn't have felt safe with Bacchus and all his wild girls if we'd met them without Aslan. I should think not, said Lucy. And that is where we'll stop at the end of chapter 11. I hope you're enjoying this book. And if you like content like this, it would mean the world to me if you would go ahead and take two seconds to hit that like button and the subscribe button. If you ring the bell, you'll be notified anytime I add a new video. Thank you so much for stopping by. I'd love to hear your comments about what you're liking about the book or what you think might happen next. Thank you again for reading with me and thank you for coming to book club with Ms. Dub. And I can't wait to read again with you soon. Bye.